Thank you, everybody, um, for being time. And I want to welcome you to the next round of our vibrant discussions. I want to stimulate you all to buy the T-shirts that we made for the event. It cost $20, and they're um, for sale over there. We also have some Chikruna T-shirts for $10. And we have some courtesy cards for free from Clancy. She's a painter as well. Um, just want to give a little reminder to the to the uh, speakers that I really would like you to write those papers that I asked for for Chikruna. <laughs> the deadline is September 15. Um, if we can make this, you know, continuation of this conversation in print, I think we can bring it even to another level. Uh, so, you know, if if you can make start making space for that would be awesome. And with that having said, I want to present my dear friend from New Mexico, the moderator. Welcome her, an author and writer, feminist, activist, peyotist, Beth. Well, welcome. I didn't know I'd be actually introducing this. This is amazing. This LGBTQ panel, and um, I wrote everyone an email saying, um, you know, I think it was Nice Devonat. Gregory reminded me that that said in the sentence, "Our psychedelics are queer." And um, Helene Sixu um, said, "Isn't all literature queer?" And, and just like, what is a, what is a kind of queerness? And so here we got the queers talking about the queer psychedelics and and so i'm curious on what we have in common if there's something particular about being a psychedelic person in this particular community um many of us um, on the panel work in a therapeutic setting um within their various communities um and i think um also carry with them a sense of history as um who they are in turn we were talking at lunch today about um about what is that guy that um Ram Das um and like is it really true that he took LSD to be straight <laughs> yeah um yeah and I wonder how many of us um you know had psychedelics be part of our coming out process and and making community and making family I mean isn't that also the nature of psychedelics and um, whatever your persuasion is um, very much a, it's it's how we make family how we make our connections the mycelial network and and all the ways that we move through the world so I do think there's um, some fitting metaphors for queerness and um, what the nature of the psychedelic experience is but I'm just really looking forward to hearing all of um, the presentations today so who's going first Via? Oh, really? <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, if, okay. Um, how about Clancy? Clancy, do you want to go first? Clancy is, yeah, but by the way, her amazing art is um, over there on the table. Um, and I know that Clancy works um, as a therapist and also in the um, Ayahuasca circles, but I will um, let you actually. I want you to hear what how you describe yourself. You know, I think you're just like awesome. I'm Clancy. I am. Uh, I graduated from the CPTR program here, um, and I am a member of Santa Daime, drinking ayahuasca for about 20 years, and I don't know what else to say about myself. I'm a psychologist in private practice, and we just presented at the uh, APA conference, uh, a psychedelic panel. You all know me not by now. So I'm going to do a um, presentation on conversion therapy and psychedelics. Um, and I want to thank... Um, the organizers, and I want to thank Bia, of course, for inviting me. So, some of the earliest mentions of anti-homosexual attitudes are found in the Old Testament. Chapters in Leviticus and Deuteronomy condemn females who wear male attire, males who wear female attire, and males who engage in homosexual intercourse. 
In the 11th century AD, St. Peter Damian wrote the Liber Gomorianus, an extended attack on homosexuality, and homosexuals were included in groups reviled by the church, including prostitutes and Jews, Muslims, and heretics. Popular opinion turned against homosexuals in the Middle Ages via religious persecution that became codified in laws condemning homosexuality. Religious leaders like St. Thomas Aquinas denounced homosexuality as a sin. In Western culture, popular opinions against homosexuality began in the realm of religion, but quickly moved into the legal arena. In 17th century colonial America, homosexuality was a crime punishable by death. Although the cultural shift regarding homosexuality as an issue of mental health seems anachronistic today, it was once viewed as progressive. Fundamental Christianity is the main supporter today of conversion therapy in the U.S. The American Psychiatric Association vote, voted to remove homosexuality from the DSM in 1973. Attempts to convert LGBT people to heterosexuality have included methods like lobotomy, electroshock to the hands, head, and genitals, testicle transplants from dead heterosexual men, bladder washing, implanting electrodes in the brain, castration, female circumcision, nausea-inducing drugs, and beatings. In 2016, for the first time, the Republican Party endorsed conversion therapy in their platform under right of parents to determine the proper medical treatment and therapy for their minor children. Conversion therapy or reparative therapy is illegal in only 16 states and has been promoted in the past by current Vice President Pence, who said resources should be directed towards those institutions which provide assistance to those seeking to change their sexual behavior, though he currently denies his support. For the first time, oh, I already said that, okay. And so one early use of uh, psychedelics by psychologists was in attempts to treat homosexuals to change their sexual orientation. Right. The opinion of the American Psychological Association is that there is, are no safe or effective ways of changing someone's sexual orientation, and therapies that claim to do so can reinforce negative views of homosexuality and can be harmful to the client. Freud believed all humans were born bisexual and that their later preferences were the results of life experiences and conditioning from parents. Homosex he said, homosexuality is assuredly no advantage, but it is nothing to be ashamed of, no vice, no degradation. It cannot be classified as an illness. Kinsey also normalized homosexuality by creating the Kinsey scale and expressing sexual orientation on a continuum. However, in the 50s, with the advent of behaviorism, the idea that homosexuality was a learned behavior was introduced and so, to treatment to cure it with behavioral in interventions, including aversion therapy, which is the pairing of a painful event with the behavior that is desired to be extinguished. Um, electrodes were implanted in homosexual men's brains by Dr. Robert Galbraith Heath in an effort to change their orientation. And the ethical foundation for treating individuals with socially undesirable traits with powerful psychedelic compounds to rid them and society of these traits is highly suspect. This presentation is a reminder that all medicine is for healing and that all medicines can be poisoned in the wrong hands. So these are some pictures of old ideas of homosexuality. And these are some devices that were sold to be used for aversive conditioning for homosexuality. And this is a map of states that um, conversion ther therapy is outlawed in. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, Alpert, which, who is Ram, Ram Das today. Um, a study by Alpert in uh, 1969 was one of the earliest reports in the literature on sexual minority experience with psychedelics. It is one example of conversion therapy found in the literature. <coughs> Alpert administered 200 micrograms of LSD to a male self-identified bisexual volunteer who was dissatisfied with his attraction to men. During his 15-hour trip, the subject was shown pictures of women and encouraged to develop feelings towards them. In subsequent LSD sessions, a woman the subject knew was present and he had sexual intercourse with her. One year after the treatment, Albert reported that the man was living with a woman but had had two subsequent homosexual encounters, <clears throat> which the subject describes as tests of himself to see if the changes he had experienced as a result of the treatment were real. Alpert explained that the use of LSD allowed the subject to take a broader view of the archetype of woman and find connections to primal desires within the archetype, which he could then generalize to all women. 
and I'm, I'll leave it to um, other presenters to talk more about that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Stanislav Grof treated homosexual clients with LSD. He came to the conclusion that gay men's dislike of sex with women was related to images of vagina dentata and castration fantasies were envisioned during LSD sessions. He related lesbianism to the desire to be close to the mother. Groff admits that he has treated mostly homosexuals who were dissatisfied with their orientation and that a healthy adjustment to same-sex orientation is possible and may not um, represent intra-psychic struggle. Groff also noted that subjects in LSD treatments often saw their sexuality in archetypal or transcultural ways, such as witnessing fertility rites, initiation ceremonies, and temple prostitution. In the varieties of psychedelic experience, masters in Houston, or Houston, I'm not sure, reported giving the psychotropic cactus peyote to a self-identified gay male volunteer. Masters in Houston's views reflect an outdated view of homosexuality as pathology. Working from the assumption that homosexuality is an undesirable orientation, masters in Houston attempted to treat their gay clients with repeated doses of peyote. In this report, they found that the participant displayed more heterosexual behavior and ha a greater desire to appreciate his appearance after the peyote experience. Masters in Houston reported that 12 out of 14 male homosexual volunteers in a psychedelic experiment had distorted body images that the researchers contended to be causal to homosexuality, although they admitted they could not prove this. They found that by taking psychedelics, the body image distortion was corrected, and they observed a trend towards heterosexualization. They also speak stereotypically of the passivity of the homosexual man being transformed by psychedelic therapy and attribute a deepening of the voice, greater vigor, improved posture, and greater masculinity <clears throat> to treatment with peyote. In a case reviewed by Masters in Houston, the researchers were discouraged by their subject's, quote, considerable investment in his homosexuality and felt unable to capitalize on the gains made in therapy. They proceeded to speculate on the progress that might have been made had the subject been more motivated or become, had been more motivated to become heterosexual. They comment on the cost effectiveness of LSD therapy too. Treatment of sexual disorders, frigidity, impotence, impotence, homosexuality, and fetishism, and some other neurosis have many times been described as both drastically shortened and made more effective when LSD was used as an adjunct to psychotherapy. This is a quote from them. For example, a London psychiatrist reported after 12 years' experience with the drug that the average number of treatment sessions required was only 25 at a cost of about $750. This compared to the psychoanalytic sessions spread over several years at a cost to the patient of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> A study by Martin in 1962 looked at the effects of LSD on 12 gay men. Martin reported LSD as a treatment for homosexuality. Administering many low doses in a treatment known as psycholytic, mind-separating therapy, and encouraging intense mother transference, Martin claimed that seven out of 12 achieved heterosexual orientation with only one slight relapse in a three to six year follow-up. Stafford and Golightly in 1967 reported on LSD therapy for homosexuals during the 60s. They found that homosexual issues were often resolved using psychedelic therapy and that homosexuals would either be at peace with their orientation after LSD therapy or decide that they were heterosexual. Stafford and Golightly viewed homosexuality to be the result of early childhood trauma and morbid dependency on parents, both of which could be treated with regressive shock, ter shock therapy with LSD. Stafford and Golightly recommended that LSD be used to treat transvestism, fetishism, and sadomasochism in the same way that it could be used to treat homosexuality. This review reflects the current thinking in the late 60s, in which homosexuality was viewed as a mental disease related to paraphilias. Burroughs and Ginsburg, both queer members of the Beat Generation, were some of the earliest reporters on the psychedelic phenomenon writing about their ayahuasca use in the Yahe letters. Prior to that, Burroughs introduced peyote to the beats, but the experience was not as profound as with Yahe. Ginsburg first met Timothy Leary when signing up for psilocybin experiments. In September 1966, Leary gave an interview to Playboy magazine. In the interview, Leary claimed that LSD could be used to cure homosexuality, telling a story about a lesbian who became heterosexual after using LSD. He later changed this view to the belief that homosexuality was not an illness in need of a cure. 
Um, so Burroughs was injecting DMT, saying the results were always interesting, if sometimes unpleasant. He began to see psilocybin, LSD, and DMT and other laboratory psychedelics as problematic. When he heard of CIA interest in the mind-controlling potential of acid, it only served to reinforce this viewpoint. Ultimately, he favored ayahuasca and cannabis. Burroughs disapproved of Leary's experiments at Harvard. Burroughs wanted a scientific approach to psychedelic research, but instead he found drugged encounter sessions involving endless theorizing about universal love, enlightenment, and game theory. <laughs> Afterwards, Burroughs published an open letter denouncing the Harvard work, upsetting Leary. Unlike Ginsburg, Burroughs was conservative about the psychedelic movement. When sexual minorities have used psychedelics, the results are sometimes quite different from early clinical research and in published reports are most often affirming of their orientation. My own research on gay people in ayahuasca showed that all 17 participants felt more positively about their sexual orientation after using ayahuasca and interpreted religious elements in ways that made sense to them as queer people. Several forums on the internet ask whether psychedelics or marijuana can make someone gay. Anonymous reports exist of people temporarily feeling attraction for the same sex due to psychedelic consumption. Psychedelics are also credited in some forms for instigating gender dysphoria or a, re a recognition of a transsexual identity. <laughs> One report made by a post-op transgender woman described her most recent experience using LSD. She and a pre-op transgender woman agreed to take LSD and, at the peak of their experiences, they agreed they would look at themselves naked, side by side, in a full-length mirror. We would look to see whether we were monsters or whether we were God's beautiful creatures. And through the wide open doors of perception, we saw the truth. We were beautiful. And these examples I've taken, uh, there's many, many more to be had, so I feel a little bad that I'm using my old examples, but um, Mark Kerr described a man who took LSD and was able to integrate and accept the fact that he had had homosexual experiences in the past, experiences he had previously been unable to reconcile with his self-image. He concluded that it was not a big deal and that and during this experience, he was able to perceive himself in a non-judgmental way that proved healing for him. Annie Sprinkle, a bisexual sex worker, educator, and performer, wrote about her experiences with drugs and entheogens. She had not tried ay ayahuasca, but had taken pharmahuasca, a combination of chemical and natural sources of DMT and MAOI. She related that she felt that experience was preparing her for her death. Her experiences led her to the conclusion that entheogens can have a role in sex therapy because they can help individuals gain a fresh perspective on their identity. She posits that sexuality and the use of entheogens are both about consciousness and self-discovery. A gay author, Young, described a trip to Peru with two other HIV-positive men to drink ayahuasca with a renowned shaman. He recounted how each man with HIV came to the same conclusion in their visions, that the virus needed them so it could live off of them, and that using this information they could negotiate a relationship where both the virus and the carrier would be able to survive. <coughs> and um, also, uh, in my research uh, for my dissertation, I looked at the ayahuasca churches in the United States, people, members of the ayahuasca churches in the United States, and. Um, I didn't really cover in other countries, especially in Brazil, where um, the Ayahuasca Church Santo Daime and the Ayahuasca, Ayahuasca Church um, Unia de Vegetal um, both have kind of anti-gay flavor to them. And the UDV actually has a formal statement against homosexuality and encourages people to drink ayahuasca to try to become heterosexual. So there's more to this story than just the... Uh, Americans in the U.S. Um, and now here's my conclusion. Psychology positions itself as the arbiter of what is mental health and what is mental illness. At one time, being gay was considered a sickness. In their enthusiasm for the fast-acting and pervasive effects of psychedelics, some practitioners tried their hand at psychedelic treatment for this undesirable attribute, even reporting several successes. How valid and representative those cures were is unknown. The culture and the understanding of homosexuality has changed vastly. 
Psychedelics have the power to provide a window into understanding aspects of our mental selves and invite us to ask questions that we may never have considered before. This power can be misused, as in the US government MK Ultra experiments and the various attempts just described to change sexual orientation using psychedelic drugs. As some other presentations at this conference attest, the great enthusiasm for the healing power of these substances needs to be tempered with a greater appreciation for the cultures, contexts, and agendas of those who control and administer them. The benefits of going old school. Um, okay, so I'm going to read. I'm a little nervous. Sure, my name is Gina Eichenbaum. Um, also a graduate of uh, CPTR, second year cohort, um, the best cohort <laughs> so far. <clears throat> You're not supposed to take sides in psychedelics, <clears throat> it takes them for you. <laughs> as I will be actually talking about. So um, the title of my talk is uh, Dissolving the Binary, the Queerness of Psychedelics. <clears throat> and I'm gonna open up this time by talking about some aspects of queer theory and mysticism. Then I'll use some of my personal firsthand experiences with the medicines as a way of elucidating the connections between queerness and psychedelics. In Wikipedia, the history of the English language use of the word queer is dated back to 16th century England. It originally meant strange, peculiar, odd, eccentric. I found that oftentimes if you listen closely, the phonetics of a term, the sound of it, points to its potential meanings. Words such as anger, disgust, serene, eternal, transform the muscles of the face in ways that create or display what the meanings might be. The same with queer, an odd word that takes us an ostensibly one syllable through at least three distinct movements of the lower facial muscles. That is queer. <laughs> in the late 19th century, it came to be used as a pejorative to describe effeminate men or men who took a passive receptive position in regards to sexual activity with other men. Reclamation of the term um, began in the mid 1980s uh, with use by the group Queer Nation in its manifesto, challenging both hetero and homonormative ideas of assimilation. The Urban Dictionary goes on to add that queer is an identity that has been taken back as a word to be more in inclusive of the whole of the LGBT community and or used to be specifically vague and non to to be specifically vague and non-specific about sexual orientation and identity used because terms like gay, lesbian and bisexual are not sufficient for one's inner feelings. Queer theory like the word queer is a much contested term always in flux, but it can be used to describe things like resisting the categorization of people, challenging the idea of essential identities, and questioning binaries like gay and straight, male and female. Now I want to spend just a couple of minutes discussing the qualities of the mystical experience, one that is fairly reliably obtainable by the ingestion of large enough doses of certain psychedelic medicines, as we all know. These states, first enunciated by William James in his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, include the following. One, ineffability, the inability to capture the experience in ordinary language. Two, noetic quality, the notion that mystical experiences reveal an otherwise hidden or inaccessible knowledge. Three, transiency, the simple fact that mystical experiences last for a relatively brief period of time. Four, passivity, the sense that the mystical experience happens to us. Five, unity of opposites, a sense of oneness, wholeness, or completeness. Six, timelessness, a sense that mystical experiences transcend time. And seven, 
a feeling that one has somehow encountered the true self, a sense that mystical experiences reveal the nature of our true cosmic self, one beyond life and death, beyond difference and duality. There's an obvious overlap between the ideas and definitions of queerness and the characteristics of mystical experiences engendered by psychedelics. Both queer theory and the mystical characteristics discuss the limitations of ordinary language to capture the actual experience one is having, whether that experience is one of timelessness that is over in 30 seconds or lasts a lifetime. Notions of transiency in the mystical experience mirror ideas in queer theory about the fluidity or non-solidity of identity labels. The passivity and sexual activity that was pejoratively noted in the original meanings of the word queer is an actual prerequisite in the psychedelic realm, both to decrease the possibility of having a bad or even horrific trip, as well as to be open to the majestic spaces the medicines can take one to. That's the importance of surrender. And of course, the feeling that one has encountered one's true self, even if that self actually may be, at some level, a complete myth, or the notion that the self is actually no self is present or hinted at in both. Once, while I was doing a combination of MDMA and psilocybin in a group setting, I, over the course of several hours, had a number of conversations with approximately eight people. During at least three of these conversations, I had the distinct impression that things were being told to me in their specific content that had been heard by me before from these same people, even though I had never spoken this way with these people before. During these conversations, I knew what they were going to say next and was surprised by my knowing this. The fact that it didn't happen all the time made it even more compelling and possibly real to me that I was having an experience of having reproduced something that took place at another time in my life, or perhaps in someone else's life, who's also Gina in some other place or dimension. At some point, I was laying next to a woman, a casual friend, who lives a life quite different from mine. She's straight, married, younger, from a different religious and cultural upbringing. At some point, I became confused as to who was who, as it were, and had the strong sense that we were somehow the same person. I later shared this with her, and she reported that she was feeling the same thing, that there was some kind of merging of our identities that took place at that moment. Self and other had dissolved. These experiences hearken to notions that Freud discussed in a paper in 1919 titled The Uncanny, which speaks of things that are strangely familiar rather than simply mysterious, and to notions of the double or doppelganger that have been explored by the psychoanalyst Otto Rank. The binary dissolves here in several ways. There's a dissolution between past and present time in the experience of deja vu, and there's a dissolution between self and other in my confusion, confusion between my identity and that of my friend. Many years before I came out as the woman I am and as trans, I was struggling with accepting myself. I experienced a tremendous amount of self-hatred and loathing, had no friends, was basically living a life of hiding and secrecy. At some point in all this, I met a guy I became friends with and learned that he was an experienced psychonaut. He was also, as it turns out, very homophobic and transphobic and was sure that if I did a large dose of LSD or psilocybin, I would work through my gender deviance and come to accept myself as a man. This was what I wanted as well, as I was desperately hoping to live a normal life. After a year of preparation under his tutelage, with lots of reading and exercise and meditation, he felt that I was ready for my first psychedelic experience and gave me 400 micrograms of LSD. This next piece is a small excerpt of a description of my journey of that day. 
Then, for the next little while, I was just floating. It was so quiet in the solar system, I could just hear the whoosh of my body going at an enormous rate of speed. At some point, I began quickly to lose altitude and then came down with a hard thump on the ground. I was surprised that I wasn't hurt. I was in the middle of a desert. Sand dunes and cactus bushes were everywhere. I looked around and wondered, after the awesomeness I had just experienced, what could possibly be next? Slowly, the ground started rumbling, almost imperceptibly at first, then louder. My body started bouncing off the ground with the shaking. Then a deep, frightening grumbling rose up, and a furious, loud, and angry voice said, What do you want? Not sure what to do, I stood, frozen, paralyzed. More insistently, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I thought, this has to be God. <laughs> I was filled with awe and terror. And before I could stop myself, I was saying more quickly than I had ever voiced anything in my life. I was saying, getting out as fast as I could possibly move my lips and far faster than I'd ever been able to move my mouth before. I was saying every single thing I had ever done or said or thought even that I was ashamed of. I couldn't speak fast enough. It poured out of me. After what seemed an indeterminate amount of time, I was spent, done. My words slowed, then stopped. And the voice again, only this time not loud at all, but rather gentle, filled with care, asked, and is there anything else? And I paused, swallowed, and said, yes, there's one more thing. I want to be a woman. There was a long pause. I could hear the desert wind rustling through the cacti. Then suddenly, in a sing-song lilt, the voice playfully asked, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and that response completely blew my mind. <laughs> the idea that I had met God and was told there was nothing wrong with my desire to be female, my sense, against all logic, that I already was, that it was not just fine, but maybe approved, really not even a big deal, <laughs> shattered me. I felt a rapid dropping away of everything in me, and then was transported out of the desert and was suddenly surfing a large wave that was cresting over the planet Earth. I was completely filled with love. I realized the water was love and everything was awash in it. I was the water as well as the rider, and it was the most incredible ride of my life. I was surfing, and it was amazing, indescribable. I was immersed in the root of everything. The voice then yelled out as it was leaving, one more thing, don't forget to laugh. <laughs> It's interesting to note that it's not just me or the familiar representation of me that was changed from ashamed to accepted, from self-loathing to self-loving, from an individual being to the water, the surf, the surfboard, the planet. God, or my notions of God, were changing as well from harsh, frightening, and quite serious to soft, loving, an impish trickster. Identities were shifting and dissolving all over the place, spanning across genders, ideas, and emotional states. Stan Groff describes psychedelics as nonspecific amplifiers of unconscious processes and content. That's an apt description. But if they're just that, there's really no reason for us to be meeting here today. And there would be perhaps less in the way of conferences, 
um, and a new renaissance taking place. We're interested in these medicines not simply because they illuminate some of the innermost aspects of our psyches, but because they appear to hold out the prospect of changing some things for the better. A recent quite small study at the Imperial College in London showed that people who had taken psilocybin and were then tested on a libertarian authoritarian scale at 3, 6, and 12 months after their experience not only showed powerful remissions of their treatment-resistant depressions, but became less authoritarian, more open, and more connected to nature. My own experience points to the possibility that the medicines have something important to say about things like external and internalized homophobia and transphobia, that they may want us to be happy and free and in deep acceptance of ourselves, even when we grow up in places and times that profoundly don't support that message. When I was a young queer coming up in the, in the 1980s, there was a new organization called Queer Nation that fought to resist the assimilation and message that we are just like you, that parts of the LGB community were putting out there as the way to be accepted. Queer Nation wasn't concerned about being accepted. They were concerned about being real and with having some fun while doing it. <laughs> so I offered that queer is commentary, queer is questioning, queer is challenging, queer is pushback, queer is weird, queer is wild, queer is the other way, queer is constantly changing, and queer is impossible to definitively define. I think that's a pretty good description of psychedelics, too. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Just invite everyone to take a deep breath. <sighs> that was for me. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, it's such an honor to be here. Um, thank you so much, Bia, for organizing this amazing conference. Thank you, Janice, for hosting. Um, I think the, um, the previous two presentations um, ended up leading really nicely into what I planned to talk about unexpectedly. Due to technical difficulties, I think it worked out perfectly, um, as these things do. Um, I just want to thank everyone for showing up uh, for our communities and for being here, keeping an open mind, staying engaged in the dialogue, even when it's hard. I feel really proud of us as a community at this conference. And what I'm here to say is not about sexual and gender minorities specifically. I'm actually wanting to speak more broadly to my observations about the tensions between social justice movements and psychedelic science. Um, I do bring in the sexual minority and gender minority perspective, both um, through I, who I am, through my identities, and um, also what I do at the University of California, San Francisco. So I wanted to just give a little bit of context to both of those things. Um, I lead research at UCSF in collaboration with transgender communities, um, primarily on issues related to health disparities. Today I'm speaking from my perspective as a genderqueer identified psychologist and social scientist. So I work in a fairly traditional academic medicine um, environment, and I try constantly to remind myself to put social justice issues at the center of my science and really at the center of my life. And so it's not a balance that's easy to strike ever, um, but I do have a lot of familiarity navigating the tensions between the mainstream and the marginalized. So I'm really trying to speak from that place today. Uh, psychedelics have played a very meaningful role in my own identity development, helping me to experience myself as a whole beyond the binary. And they've helped me to understand that uh, identifying as genderqueer is, for me, about fluidity. It's about um, being free to be all of who I am beyond social constraints. 
And over the years, my personal journey with psychedelics has evolved into more of a spiritual journey. And I've really been focusing on healing myself and being of service to those who are healing themselves. And as an academic, I came to the Renaissance in psychedelic science fairly recently. I was very honored to be included among the first cohort of graduates of the certificate program in psychedelic therapies and research um, under the esteemed leadership of Dr. Janice Phelps. And um, this training was transformative. It truly changed my life. It actually changed the direction of my life completely. And um, I've still been processing that experience because you know, as I read the scientific literature and engaged in really amazing conversations with colleagues, I was continually surprised by the lack of social justice analysis in mainstream psychedelic research and how new this conversation was to this field. Maybe that's because I come out of a background of really centering social justice in my academic work. But clearly the conversation is evolving and this symposium is clear evidence of how we're maturing as a field. So I want to acknowledge that even in our tremendous gratitude for all the hard work that has come before us, the incredible accomplishments, the passion, the sacrifice, there's still a longing within us as a community, a sense of something missing, a disconnection, something's not quite right. So uh, as we're all well aware, um, earlier this year, MAPS announced that they recently accepted a million dollars from the Mercer Family Foundation. And uh, most of us know by now who the Mercers are and the various sentiments around uh, this decision based on yesterday's conversations and others that have happened in community spaces. Um, but for me, just a few highlights are the fact that um, the Mercer Family Foundation owns a major stake in Breitbart, which is a... Um, has been affiliated with associating racist ideologies and agendas. Um, and they gave $25 million to the Trump campaign in 2016, which played an absolutely critical role in his election. They're also major supporters of the Heritage Foundation, um, a conservative think tank that openly promotes racist ideologies. And I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> um, so personally... I was floored and appalled when I heard about the Mercer donation. I was literally heartbroken. And this moved me to write an emotional email. Um, I don't usually just fire off emotional emails, but I did this time. And it actually led to some really productive conversations on a listserv of women in psychedelics. Um, and, I, and I wrote it to that listserv because um, there were women on that list that I really trusted in terms of their opinions. And so we had really important conversations that I won't rehash, but I will say that that was a turning point for me in terms of the questions I was asking myself about who I am within this movement and what values are truly at the center of our science. So to quote our esteemed moderator, Bette Williams, she says um, in The Wild Kindness, she published a great essay, um, I forget the name of the blog, but it's Lena Dunham's blog, uh, called The Wild Kindness, um, is Bette Williams' essay. And she says, many argue that such compromises and deals with the devil are necessary in, to, to destigmatize psychedelics in the minds of the mainstream populace. My question has always been, to achieve what exactly and for whom? As a result of these conversations, I realized that the shock that I felt came from an unexamined assumption I had been making that social justice is inherently part of the agenda of psychedelic science. In retrospect, I can see how naive this assumption was. I began to grapple with a new question. Should psychedelic science necessarily be concerned with social justice issues? For me, the answer depends on what the ultimate goal of the science truly is. The legalization agenda must not aim or even appear to aim to disrupt any existing hierarchies or value systems currently upheld by our government, lest the government perceive our science to be a threat to the status quo. 
I'm so grateful for people like Amy Emerson, who is so intelligent and so amazing at navigating these very complicated systems and navigating these extremely tough scenarios. And I think it's really important work. Um, and there's no such thing as science outside of a political context or without a political lens. Science is constantly being shaped by social forces, unexamined assumptions, funding, and legal contexts. So Daniel Dennett in Darwin's Dangerous Idea said, there is no such thing as philosophy-free science. There's only science whose philosophical baggage is taken on board without examination. Our values shape the scientific questions we ask, the ways that we design our research, how we interpret the conclusions, and who we intend to serve. We replicate our social programming in our psychedelic science. Clancy's presentation was a, an amazing example of that. Another example of this replication is the requirement that psychedelic-assisted therapy teams be comprised of one man and one woman. This protocol is based on the assumption that clients need to have their biological parents reflected by the therapy team. However, there is absolutely no empirical evidence supporting this assumption, which does not account for people who were raised by gay parents, uh, transgender people, or even single parents for that matter. And it also doesn't take into consideration the client's presenting issues or the client's personal preferences. Further, are the required male-female therapist pairs necessarily cisgender? Where is the room for transgender or gender non-binary, gender queer therapists in this model? So without questioning, we replicate heteronormative assumptions about sexuality, families, gender, race. And often by default, we repeatedly center the voices of straight white men in our conversations. Do we ultimately want our psychedelic science to reinforce our cultural assumptions, or do we want it to revolutionize them? Personally, just speaking for me, <laughs> I'm interested in being part of the revolution. In order to succeed, though, we must make the goals of the revolution compelling and clear. Like psychedelic justice, for example, for me, psychedelic justice is about disrupting our default mode network on a cultural level. Let's get clearer about the types of questions we are asking and why. Which scientific questions reinforce our cultural assumptions and which ones revolutionize them? So different questions create different types of knowledge. This is an idea that was introduced in the 1960s by Habermas, who was a German philosopher and critical theorist. So technical questions like, what are the effects of psychedelics on the brain are critical because they help us advance the foundation of our science, but they don't tell us what to do with it. Interpretive questions can help us understand the implications of our findings. They help us generate hypotheses about the importance of mystical experiences, for example. Interpretive questions might explore psychedelic use in different cultures so we can learn from them to inform our own practices. Emancipatory questions are interested in human liberation, even salvation. They ask, how can psychedelics help us address the root causes of trauma, ongoing trauma, not post-traumatic stress disorder, but racism, transphobia, sources of ongoing trauma. We're going back into these systems. How might psychedelics foster resilience so that we can all stay engaged in the revolution? How can psychedelics help save us from the destructive path we're on? We must go beyond trying to recruit diverse populations into studies that have been designed by straight white people for straight white people. We need research that is truly grounded in our communities with full participation by the communities themselves. We need to broaden our conceptualization of how we design research, and not all research needs to be within a clinical trial framework. 
The Western medical framework devalues emancipatory approaches to knowledge production. In psychedelic science, I think we've been missing the emancipatory perspective. We kind of have assumed it was there, but it's really been missing from the, the above board dialogues. We need to be truly integrated within the technical and the interpretive for the revolution we envision to actually manifest as a product of our psychedelic science. We need this integration in order to raise the level of the questions we are asking about what is possible. Yesterday, Laura Dev used a phrase that I really love called disrupting hierarchies of knowledge. And she was speaking specifically about interspecies alliance and forms of knowledge, which blew my mind because that that's new for me. But using an integrated emancipatory framework, we might ask, how do we disrupt the default mode network of an entire culture? I'm excited to hear about all the different ways we are all engaged in this disruption. So let's revisit the initial question. Should psychedelic science necessarily be concerned with social justice issues? Some people might say no. We're not just one psychedelic community anymore. Some of us will choose to build bridges with people who espouse racist agendas for money. And some of us will help rich people get richer by co-opting our medicines. That's going to happen. It's happening. And some of us are interested in radical cultural transformation. Our values shape the questions we ask. So in this spirit, I am inspired by, uh-oh, losing power. No. Okay. <laughs> um, in the spirit, I'm inspired by um, Adrienne Marie Brown, um, this book called Emergent Strategy. I recommend everyone read it. She asks how, thank you. Um, she asks, how do we collaborate on the process of dreaming, envisioning, and implementing a world that works for more people? We must bring justice to our own psychedelic communities if we expect to revolutionize society with psychedelics. We're not there yet. We don't have examples of how to create psychedelic community as a microcosm of what we want to see in the world. There is no utopia. We have glimpses of it in some spaces, discussions that center the voices of people of color, queer people, indigenous people, aspects of psychedelic festivals and the celebration there, Burning Man's gifting culture, the healing spaces at Lightning in a Bottle, Women's Visionary Congress. And we can also clearly see where we're still challenged. I praise our communities for our honesty and longing for wholeness, for not settling for the almost or the could be. Psychedelics themselves have provided us with a vision of what is possible, and we will not settle for anything less than fulfillment of that vision. Psychedelic justice is based on collaborative ideation, the birthing of new ideas and sharing that process collectively. The open science statement is a beautiful example of an attempt at that. The more people who co-create the future, the more people whose concerns will be addressed on a foundational level. It's up to us to create alternative conversations. Instead of calling each other out, let's create spaces to find each other and participate. Psychedelic justice is about creating alternatives rather than perpetually recreating the system. An attempt at this was made in the 60s with Science for the People. This was a non-hierarchical, radical group of scientists and activists that sought to resist militarization of scientific research and the corporate control of research agendas. These fundamental questions of power and ideology still remain in science today, and Science for the People is being revitalized. I say we need a chapter called Psychedelics for the People. Um, maybe this could be a way of bringing some accountability to the movement around social justice issues. Just thought. <laughs> a sacred rage is building. 
Our psychedelic hearts are capable of profound bliss and ecstatic reverence, and they also feel a deep, passionate longing for what we know is possible. That longing is growing from an inner sense of disquiet to a full-on sacred rage. Let us remember that this collective rage is a beginning, not the destination. Its purpose is to guide us to a higher, more connected way of living. A new paradigm needs a new lexicon. We're introducing new ideas, new terms, new questions that will help us co-create the revolution together. We're all being invited to participate. Thank you. All right. I am going to um, throw some feathers and glitter on this very important conversation that we're having. Um, but before I do that, um, gosh, Gina, oh my God, thank you so much for sharing that story. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge as I stand here and talk to you, as a, a, a queer white man, that we are missing voices of queer people of color in this conversation. And I know those voices are here and those voices are out there, so um, let's make sure that in future programming we, we always include those voices. And I know we had this conversation and there are attempts to do that, so. Um, so I also wanna acknowledge, oh, I see this is a, actually an older slide set that I sent, okay. Um, uh, I had some help on this by a uh, MFT intern here in San Francisco, Colin Stack Trost, which uh, some of you met last night at the dinner. Um, he was instrumental in, in helping me with this, um, putting this together. So before focusing on the roles, of, more recent roles of queer folks in the psychedelic movement, um, I first want to draw attention to and recognize um, the longstanding presence of blended spirit, two-spirit, and third gender people who've existed in many ancient cultures and who continue to play important roles in current indigenous cultures. <clears throat> Two-spirit people who identify with both male and female characteristics have been recorded in over 130 Native American cultures throughout history. In many tribes, they were greatly respected and said to be more human and more spiritually gifted than other people as they were both woman and man. It was also not uncommon for these people to be apprenticed to the tribal shaman or healer. After years of oppression from white colonialists and the Christian church, two people have been re reclaiming their rightful place for the last several decades. There is evidence of their role in other shamanic cultures as well, including the ancient Incan and Mayan civilizations, as well as in present day Siberia. So other examples um, shown here on the bottom left there, third gender peoples from the Pacific Islands in Indonesia, um, the Mushe of the Zapotec community in Oaxaca, um, home of Maria Sabina, as people probably know. So I'm very curious to know what role they may have played in, in healing in, in that community. Um, on the bottom right is a picture of Maladoma Some. He's a West African elder, author and teacher from the Dagara tribe of Burkina Faso. I hope I got those pronunciations right. Um, according to Some, his culture honors gays as having a higher vibrational level that positions them to be guardians of the gateways to the spirit world. The term gatekeepers is also used by the Dogon of Mali to describe their gay and lesbian members who are said to be able to open any and all gates and gates in the here means different states of consciousness. Whereas heterosexual people are primarily limited to their male or female gates. <clears throat> so now jumping ahead a bit to the 1950s and 60s of the United States, we've already spoken a bit about Ram Dass, who as Richard Alpert was a member of the famous uh, or infamous Harvard Psychedelic Club, along with Timothy Leary shown in the photograph, as well as Andrew Weil. Um, and as Clancy mentioned, yes, as far as we know, uh, Richard Alpert in the 60s did participate in some LSD uh, curative work with homosexuals. Uh, much later in life, as, as Ram Dass, he spoke more openly about his own internalized shame as a gay man and the need for healing the guilt and shame in the gay community. 
Um, in a 2001 interview, when asked about hallucinogens as a spiritual path, he is quoted as saying, it is a fabulous path and everyone should try it. <laughs> um, in a later interview from 2014, he went on to say, I went, from, I went from psychology to psychedelics. The mushrooms showed me my inner self. I hope he got some healing from that. During that first mushroom trip, I said, I'm home. I'm home. It was something that psychology had never acknowledged. A little bit more overlap with Clancy. From the same era, we have Allen Ginsberg, beat poet, author of Howl, which includes references to his peyote experiences, and leader of the counterculture movement. Along with Timothy Leary, Ginsberg um, strongly advocated the use of psychedelic drugs as a means of self-discovery and the expansion of consciousness. <clears throat> in 1966, he testified very eloquently before a Senate subcommittee conducting hearings about LSD, where he also spoke about his experiences with ayahuasca in Peru. Um, there are actually some clips of that on YouTube. Uh, many authors and academics have pointed out that psychedelics were very connected to the gay liberation movement. And both were, in part, a response to the repressive culture of the 1950s America. As the psychedelic San Francisco of the 60s became the gay San Francisco of the 70s, we have the emergence of the coquettes onto the scene. Yay, long-time San Francisco people. <laughs> <laughs> the coquettes were an avant-garde psychedelic hippie theater group founded by Hibiscus, shown there on the left, who had been a member of a commune called Cauliflower that was dedicated to distributing free food and to creating free art and theater. They existed from about 1969 to 1972 and were known for political parody, gender bending and blending, and LSD. They have been described as when hippie meets drag on LSD. <laughs> the Cockettes se celebrated sexual experimentation and free love. Most were reported to be bisexual, celebrating a polyamorous relationship with nearly all who entered the Cockette house. I'm going to read an excerpt from a book called Midnight at the Palace, My Life as a Coquette by Sweet Pam. The big night was October 31st, and it was a mob scene. Backstage, the cast preened and gossiped. In light of the holiday, we were served up an additional treat in addition to the usual marijuana backstage, and no one was in any hurry. Um, methylene dioxyamphetamine, better known as MDA, made the rounds of the usual psychedelic drug takers in the cast, and even got so far as into the hands of Goldie Glitters, an unusual non-psychedelic drug taker. Similar to its modern-day cousin, Ecstasy, MDA was a recreational drug with both stimulant and hallucinogenic properties. It was all we needed. I'm imagining that night was very fun. Um, another coquette named Wally was said to have spent hours assembling his high drag, which was filled with glitter and feathers and extremely colorful. He would then trip around the city, spreading the love, coming home days later with a drag looking much worse for the wear. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of that. <laughs> um, some of the more famous members of the, the Cockettes. Sylvester was one of the original Cockettes, um, who went on to become a major musical star of the disco era and who openly and publicly talked about um, his penchant for enjoying LSD and hashish. Divine of John Waters fame is shown there on the right, who, um, who also appeared with the Cockettes. So in 1979, Harry Hay, shown there on the upper, upper left, often referred to as the founder of the modern gay movement and the, and the father of gay liberation, recognized the need for conscious change to come to, or sorry, for conscious beings to come together to assume responsibility for social and political change. And this is from his writings. To share insights about ourselves, to dance in the moonlight, to renew our oaths against patriarchy, corporations, racism, to hold, protect, nurture, and caress one another, to talk about the politics of the gay aspirantment, the aspirantment of gay politics, 
to find the healing place inside our hearts, to become inspirer, listener, as we share new breakthroughs in how we perceive gay consciousness, to soar like an eagle, to rediscover, reinvent our myths, to talk about gay living and loving alternatives, to experience the groundlessness of the calmest root, to share our gay visions, to sing, 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 to evoke the great fairy circle. And thus the radical fairies were born. So if you're not familiar with the radical fairies, this mythopoetic creature was first and foremost free of not just heteronormativity, but the gay assimilationist burden of imitation as well. Straight gayness was abandoned for a new fairy aesthetic. Cosmetic rainbows trailed from eyelids, across mustaches, and around nipples. Feathers, beads, and bells dangled everywhere. Clothing worn was for shade or to pad a seat. Modesty was quietly banished. <laughs> Unlike the coquettes, the radical fairies are very much in existence today, with sanctuaries existing in several states and countries. Now, both the coquettes and the radical fairies later gave rise to San Francisco's beloved Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Yes. While not explicitly connected to the use of psychedelics, they are certainly the world's most psychedelic nuns, <laughs> often referred to as radical genderfuck artists, and they advocate for raising consciousness and spirituality. So this is from their website. <clears throat> <clears throat> Dramatic pause. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence is a leading edge order of queer nuns. Since our first appearance in San Francisco on Easter Sunday, 1979, the sisters have devoted ourselves to community service, ministry and outreach to those on the edges, and to promoting human rights, respect for diversity, and spiritual enlightenment. We believe all people have a right to express their unique joy and beauty, and we use humor and irreverent wit to expose the forces of bigotry, complacency, and guilt that chain the human spirit. So if that does not espouse a psychedelic ethos, I don't know what does. Um, with names such as Sister Selma Soul, Sister Sybil Liberties, Sister Anita Blowjob, <laughs> and Sister Helena Handbasket, and with orders in at least 13 U.S. states, eight countries on five continents, they have raised millions for AIDS organizations, LGBTQ organizations, and mainstream community organizations as well. The San Francisco chapter has raised well over $1 million at this point, so they do a lot of amazing work. Um, <clears throat> so by the late 1970s, both LSD and MDMA were fueling all-night dancing. Clubbing as we know it was being invented by gay black men in venues such as the Warehouse in Chicago and the Paradise Garage in New York City. Larry LeVan and Frankie Knuckles' house music combined with MDMA to create a new type of gay spirituality. By the 1980s, this included The Saint in New York and the infamous Stark Club in Dallas. The normal clubbing experience is intensified in gay clubs because of what American therapist Alan Downs, Downs calls velvet rage. Some of the sacred rage. Many of those on the dance floor will have escaped to city bars and clubs after suffering years of oppression and bigotry. The music and the drugs offer a release and a place of sanctuary. So academics have compared the unifying intensity, hedonism, and liberation in gay clubs to the spirituality and escapism of historical dance macabre, or dan dances of death. And these were rituals that were used to cope with pain and plague in the medieval era. So, <clears throat> bringing us to today, 
where are the queers, fairies, and revolutionaries in the psychedelic movement? Obviously, we're here on this panel. We're in this, we're in this room. And we're coming out of the closet. Queer shamans, healers, practitioners, and facilitators are working in the underground on FDA-approved studies and across the globe in a variety of settings. Now, I believe that coming out is always a process of healing, of introspection, and often a process in need of guidance and support. It can occasion an existential crisis um, with the death of an old way of being and the birth of a new. So many of us are in this new space right now, and it is sometimes painful and often uncomfortable. As, as Bet said earlier, Nisi Devano wrote, the oppression and alienation of both psychedelic and queer people results from a common cultural prejudice against those who experience and interact with the world differently from the dominant and traditional population. She goes on to say, queer is by definition whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, or the dominant. So the dominant paradigm does not include psychedelics or queerness, but obviously that's changing. Therefore, psychedelics are inherently queer. Journeying and tripping can be seen as radical acts of queerness. Thus, my psychedelic friends and colleagues, today we find ourselves in a room full of queers. <laughs> so, thank you. It was really wonderful. There's so many overlaps. Um, yeah, I want to take some questions from the audience, but I, I want to make a comment. Um, coming out as a psychedelic person was disturbing because I felt like I'd come out as a queer already, and and it was kind of um, like, gosh, it was really weird to suddenly feel self-conscious and like the state didn't like me and wanted me in jail and all of that. Did anybody have a kind of second coming out? with um, becoming psychedelic and queer and it being, feeling like, oh wow, it's, it really does feel like a coming out. I don't know if we need a mic for, for everyone to pass it. Or, uh, yeah, I don't know. Hello, yes. Um, yeah, I felt like I just did it again. Um, <laughs> Yeah, when I was in graduate school in the early 1990s, I can't, I couldn't have imagined a day when I would talk openly about psychedelic use. Um, that was something I very much kept to myself. So um, being involved in the, the work that I do has been an ongoing process, very much of, of coming out of the psychedelic closet. And every time I do it, there's still a little bit of nervousness and hesitation and um, how's that gonna go? Um, so yeah, it's an ongoing process. Just to give us some variety or whatever, as a member of an ayahuasca church, my experience coming out as as a psychedelic user was very couched in a pretty different way than most people here. Um, and from the start, we were trying to focus on um, legalization for the church, which we had reasonable hope for because of, well, parts of it are, are legal now. So I just wanted to say that it's different for different people. Does anybody have any questions out there from the audience? Hi, thank you so much. That was such an incredible panel and, oh. Oh, sure. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm not on the spot at all. Um, 
Um, my name is Britta Love, um, and the intersection of sexuality and um, social justice and psychedelics is kind of where my heart is and my head is most of the time. And so being here at the whole conference has been amazing and this panel particularly is so inspiring to hear stories of, you know, more than just the anecdotes in my own communities around how the, um, how sexuality and, and self-acceptance can be um, like generated by these medicines, especially since my own experience when I first um, experienced like ayahuasca circles was often in very heteronormative spaces where even though I didn't identify as queer at the time, even as a sex worker, just feeling completely oppressed by the patriarchal aspects of the way the ceremony was organized around gender and sexuality. So I feel like there's so much here, and um, and I'm always really excited to talk to anyone who wants to talk about. I do some writing and speaking in the world around these things, and I just want to like, I'm here from New York because I want to talk to other people who are who are vibing on this. So um, my question was kind of um, just wanting to hear more from any of you who've had experiences that have kind of um, participating in circles or with queer healers. Um, just like uh, spaces where taking taking the spiritual and intentional um, uses of these medicines and seeing what happens when we take it out of some of the traditional power structures. So I guess just like any stories of um, how this is how psychedelics are being queered. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'm holding. I'm, I'm holding. I'm holding the mic. Um, so there it is. Um, I mean, I think that um, I think the story that I related is um, such an example, such a kind of shocking, surprising example to me. Um, certainly, it was to my guide um, <laughs> of um, of the undoing of power structures and the undoing of accepted norms and the deep challenging and questioning of what's right and wrong and life affirming and life withholding. So, and I've had many other experiences along those lines. Um, in very different contexts, but you know the medicines have continued to um, teach me um, new ways that um, that you're not going to get on the six o'clock news um, that have to do with identity and freedom. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I don't know how much I'm really speaking to the question, but I think the possibilities for liberation are. Um, are endless in this world, and um, and um, yeah, I'm just really grateful to be a part of it and to have experienced it so far. Just wanted to make a comment for all the people that came from New York. Uh, we really appreciate you flying all through the country, and we have a few numbers of views here. So thanks and. Maybe next edition we could go to all to New York when you organize it for us. Uh, my name is Kevin and I'm from New York and I, I want to thank Bia and everyone for making sure there were bagels and cream cheese. Um, my question is something that was brought up. I think there are questions that are raised in a few of your talks, and one of the larger, I think, philosophical ideas coming around very quickly in the community is, what are the inherent effects of psychedelics and psychedelic experiences, and what are effects that we only experience if we have a certain cultural predisposition? And one of my questions is, if there are indigenous groups who have been using psychedelics for long periods of time, and they've generated homophobic patriarchal power structures, how does that inform a discussion about what is an inherent effect of a psychedelic? Um, and the second question is related to that within the, the northern community where a lot of these cultures are being 
revered and idolized by many users who are in search of an authentic ayahuasca or cultural experience, what do some of the incompatibilities between modern liberal progressive thought um, and reverence for indigenous authentic cultures that may not share those values? So I would be happy to listen to anything any of you have to say about that. Uh, gosh, um, this is not my area of expertise. I'm very firmly rooted in, you know, Western culture and don't pretend to be any other, any other way, but I have experienced um, some of like the Bay Area edition. <laughs> um, and it's been really interesting uh, to participate, you know, having really come to my own queer identities as, um, you know, in more of like the club scene that Greg put pictures up on and coming to my psychedelic identity with a pretty firm grasp on my queer identity and a firm grasp of who I am in terms of my gender and sexuality. And then uh, coming into these ayahuasca circles that are sort of bringing in this um, very patriarchal, very hetero heteronormative structure. Um, I felt very alienated in that environment and um, especially because it felt very contrived in many ways um, because it's, you know, really kind of taken out of the cultural context. And so it's been interesting participating um, sort of off and on in, in those ayahuasca circles and then in my own sort of spiritual medicine community personally um, that isn't necessarily inherently queer, but does include a lot of queer people, um, to watch the people in my community struggle with how to talk about and how to address and how to accommodate and how to like truly incorporate all of us. And, um, you know, the different queer people in, in our community have handled it really different ways. And I, and, um, some people really felt like they couldn't participate because of um, how other people in the community were struggling um, with how to um, talk about and think about, say, like gender queer people or people that don't fit the binary structure of what was being imported. Um, so I chose to stay and continue to engage in those conversations. And um, that, you know, it's a, it's a consistent struggle. And I think it mirrors a lot of the struggles that we're having here where um, I personally feel like it's really important to continue to participate and to continue to have those dialogues and like what does it mean that like you said we're um, sort of recreating these um, ceremonies that grew up in a cultural context that's not our own and um, I think it's an ongoing conversation and an, an ongoing experience and I think it's really important that we stay true to who we are and um, how we relate um, within those communities that's helpful something I think it I think that one of the main effects of psychedelics is to bring on a spiritual experience and if your acquaintance with like for example Santo Daime the guy who founded it his acquaintance with spirituality was with Catholicism so he channeled it all through Catholicism and ended up with like a pretty conservative view of uh, spirituality even though it was fed by ayahuasca. So um, I think that whatever dominant, like it, it's up to queers or gay people to speak up and like, in, which is happening in, in the Santa Daime Church now, like say this, you know, this doesn't fit and there are some trans people who don't feel like they belong on, like it's divided up into men and women. And so there's, it's up to us to speak up because I think it, I think, people have a spiritual experience and then they think about what is spirituality and then they think about religion a lot of times because that's what we understand and so it gets channeled that way so the only way it can change I think is if there's enough people who within whatever tradition to speak up I know that it, there's a whole bunch of other issues and I want to recommend our book of Bia and mine Ayahuasca Shamanism in the Amazon and Beyond which talks about intercultural um, yeah, like I think um, for me, I do um, a lot of traditional um, ceremonies in the in the Lakota way, and then I have found doing mushrooms. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, like having listened to like the Mazatec way and the chants and the Catholic influence, um, 
I've gone through a process of, of questioning, like, everything is colonized. Like, every th ceremony on some level has has come in contact with a colonizing force. And, and there's nothing like the plants to, to sort of reveal that. Like, I had a wonderful experience coming, doing San Pedro with no um, point of reference whatsoever. Um, and like, I read that you're supposed to do it at night and and I couldn't, I just couldn't, couldn't. <laughs> and then I, I realized like, oh, they were Catholic and they were totally going to be killed if they didn't do it at night. And so I did it in the daytime and it was, it was so wild to be on a substance where with no ceremonial cultural context whatsoever. And it taught me a lot about um, how, how these ceremonial situations happen. They are oftentimes political, cultural, they, they grow. And, and even in New Mexico, we have um, Pueblo cultures that are constantly changing ceremonially. Um, everything is always, always shifting. So I think um, the medicines themselves have a way of teaching us um, that we don't need to, to be doing these things if they're, they're keeping us in a stuck way and controlling us because sometimes that's what the ceremony was for, was to control you. So, so it's okay to question um, you know, something if it's not working for your community, keeping you alive. Yeah. Sorry, um, I like, I have a lot of opinions. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say, you know, a few things. One thing is that a lot of times we look at indigenous cultures and we, we project our own ideas into them and we say, you know, they're being very patriarchal or prejudiced against women, for example. Uh, menstruating women cannot take ayahuasca and then we say you know that's patriarchal and it's not necessarily patriarchal like there's also local understandings on such restrictions that have to do with larger cosmological issues with fertility with hunting with you know a larger economy of predation and exchange with the spiritual world like there's a whole line of reasoning that you can not just project your own you know, external element and say, oh, women are excluded there, you know, excluding women, because there's a logic in a lot of those things. So I think, I think one, one main thing is to always try to learn about the culture you're going to and try to ask how they see things in those terms. And, you know, that's by, by trying to, that's the main job of the anthropologist is to try to do this exercise of seeing the world with another lenses and by doing this mediation, this translation, you acquaint, you gain new knowledge. That is one point. The other point is also uh, that there's a lot of potential richness in these exchanges. And I think as a Brazilian, uh, I just realized how much I felt oppressed uh, and how much I feel free in here in the USA, uh, in, in the Bay Area. So I think, you know, Americans have all this permanent white guilt. Oh, we're so bad, but there's things that are good here. Uh, and, you know, particularly for the ayahuasca cultures in Brazil, I think the US is doing great influence. <laughs> because here, like, you know, the Brazilians come, like the people of the churches are like having, mixed gay saunas and then they have to dress up because the Brazilians are coming <laughs> and you know that's very bad so the, the California is like okay let's dress up the Brazilians are coming so I think you know there's things that this there's a lot of good things that can come from this um, cultural exchanges and then again it's it's our job to do that homework because a lot of like women and this has a lot to do with this whole thing of sexual abuse. They, we were just in Peru now, and our friend told the driver, she looked at him and she said, you have such beautiful eyes, and she smiled at him. And I told her, like, this is gonna be very bad interpreted. Like, you can't just tell a man, random in South America, that kind of thing. <laughs> and she's like, really? But he had so beautiful eyes. So, you know. <laughs> Cultural awareness, I think, is a fundamental thing. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, you right over there. Okay. I will, uh, we have one here also. So oh, I'll take this too. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, two things. One, one name I didn't hear among all the leaders of the psychedelic gay sort of queer culture was Dennis Perone. 
who was one of the fathers, uh, a small number of fathers of medical marijuana in this town, and uh, also a, a, an avowed uh, psychedelic user and public about it. Um, but the other thing was uh, when Jay was talking about there being two people, two therapists, a male, female team in the room with people, it's interesting because Again, rather than just going, oh, okay, it's it's heteronormal, it's patriarchy. You know, you it helps to ask why, and I didn't realize why for more than a decade. But it turns out, some of the early people who used MDMA in therapy abused their patients with sexual harassment and abuse, and so having two people in the room and preferably of different sexes. What is has been intended for a long time without revealing why as a guard against that so that we don't screw that up again this time <laughs> so you know so what you're saying is that um, the woman is essentially there to police the male therapist's behavior I mean let's let's be real <laughs> Um, you know, when I asked um, several um, psychologists from the NYU uh, team about this male-female therapist pairing, the, the answer that they gave me was about the, um, you know, the assumption about the client's needs for projecting biological parents. So that was the answer that I accepted. Um, it, that really uh, disturbs me if the reason that you gave is actually true, um, but I can see I can see what you're saying. I, I would hope that just having two people in the room would be a, a protection against sexual abuse. Um, and you know the other sort of anecdote that one of the psychologists at NYU shared, which I then um, kind of questioned him again about the the, the uh, biological parent projection was you know he shared an anecdote this is separate from this conversation about a, a, a patient that he was working with that was projecting mother issues onto him and i was like okay so does that mean that it doesn't matter what the gender of the person is in order for people to work out their you know parental issues if that's what they need to do and he kind of you know didn't know what to do with the question. So I feel like it's something to explore. And even if this is not going to be a requirement in the REMS or around how this therapy is delivered, I think it's important that we continue to question our assumptions about how we're designing our science so that we're not continually either reinforcing heteronormative norms or making assumptions about male sexuality, that it constantly needs to be policed by women. Uh, let's have men do some of that work. Uh, yeah, I just want to add one other piece to the two therapists, male-female dynamic, which is um, um, uh, there's an explosion in the field of gender around multiplicity of identities that is happening now. And it's happening, you know, oftentimes predominantly in places like the Bay Area or New York or more urban centers where, you know, people are congregating. Um, so, um, so a lot of people and a lot of younger people don't identify as male or female. Those particular categories or labels um, are not encompassing of the entire population. So there's going to be a lot of therapists um, coming up in the psychedelic realm that don't um, that don't subscribe to a binary system of gender. So a lot of those people are going to end up as guides in both um, overground and underground work. And um, there has to be a place for that knowledge and wisdom. Um, so yeah. That's right. And a lot of clients are going to feel safer with somebody um, who's identifying as some version of non-binary. Thank you for this awesome panel. It was really great and um, really inspiring. Um, I was curious, Jay, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, I was curious to hear more about the emancipatory framework um, and what that might look like in practice if we want to think about um, brainstorming or if in your own work um, 
Yeah, what like I'm curious to think about kind of concretely what it what it might be. Well, I think you know, like I said, I think it's important that um, we bring the uh, emancipatory type questions into the dialogue, which I think that this conference has done a really good job of doing. And I think it's also important that when we're um, using an emancipatory framework to look at, you know, say for example, how we design research, it's really important that it's actually integrated into, you know, sort of technical and interpretive type um, uh, questions that that we might be pursuing scientifically. Like, um, so for example, um, you know, in the current clinical trials. There are, um, you know, we like we heard yesterday. There are incredible racial disparities in terms of the um, recruitment and you know people being able to be enrolled into these clinical trials. So, um, you know, uh, a natural sort of impulse is to say, well, how do we get more people into the clinical trials? Um, an interpretive question might ask, well, why are they, why are people not enrolling in our clinical trials? Well, people don't feel safe. You know, that makes sense. Maybe we just need to do more outreach and education about the safety of psychedelics. That's great. When you integrate an emancipatory framework and you think, okay, how can we make this work for more people? We start to ask, okay, can we actually guarantee that these are safe um, environments and that these are safe? This is a safe context to be enrolling people of color into a research design that's designed by white people where the therapists are all white. We can't actually guarantee that that's a safe context unless we re unless we design the research with the input of people of color who are you know researchers, scientists, therapists, um, and really look at how we're structuring the therapy. And I think um, you know there are re very good reasons that were also ha that have also been discussed about why people of color distrust um, medical institutions and. Uh, scientific research, and there there are really good reasons why people are not enrolling in these clinical trials. So we as white people can't say, oh, we just need to do better outreach or get some people from within the communities to say that they should come and enroll. It's, it doesn't work that, like that. So those are the kinds of like insights that I think we can start to gain when we truly integrate the, an emancipatory framework into the questions we're already asking. So, you know, ideas about capitalism and these other things that I think also need to be integrated, plant knowledge, for example, we can start to look at that from an emancipatory framework and then integrate it into ways that we're currently thinking about science. Thank you. Great. Um, I'd like to first off, Jake, say um, I appreciate you holding us to account on social justice and psychedelic research, and I think they should be together. And so let's continue to try to make that happen. I would say about the two therapists that John was you know, describing a real situation, that is one of the reasons why we thought that, to have a male-female team. Another reason is what you heard from the NYU team. And then another one is to make sure we had a lot of women in our project. If we were just to have left it without like male-female, and I realize that's limited, We've already had two women in one of our studies as a therapy team, so it's not like we're religious about it in any way. So I'm curious, um, you know, how you think about um, in the future how you would structure it, how you would decide when somebody, you know, because I think the two therapist model is a good idea, but how would you decide which two? So that's one question also for you, Greg. How do you decide those things? And then the other thing I just wanted to say about Rebecca Mercer is it's not enough to say she's done bad things. And we don't agree with those bad things. Same truth with Peter Thiel, we heard that yesterday. Yeah, these are, so how do we engage with the larger society and how do we try to build bridges? So just at least from what you just presented here, it's not enough to say, you know, and you left out the worst I think of her was uh, Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you know, but, but it's, a, it's a deeper conversation about how we engage. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll speak to your second question first and then maybe let Greg chime in on the therapist question if you like. Um, um, so, Rebecca Mercer, I think. Um, you know, I agree. I think building bridges is really important. I think engaging in dialogue is really important. I don't think that's necessarily the same as accepting money. 
and I don't think it's the same as, um, as I think what, what really kind of broke my heart about it was the announcement that MAPS made about it and how proudly the, the um, donation was, um, was announced and how much, how m much language around it was, you know, this is inspiring and they should be lauded for their insight and their support of our, you know, of, of this research. And I, I just don't feel like I feel the same level of passion for reaching out to communities of color and really putting social justice issues on the, on the forefront of the, the MAPS agenda. And so it, um, you know, having already felt a little bit um, sort of missing from the conversation, my communities and the communities that I care about, to see Rebecca Mercer put out there as this inspiring and lauded figure of you know of insight and innovation, just felt like mm, just uh, it just got me, you know. And um, so so yeah, I think I think having a dialogue and accepting money is a different thing. And I think the ways that we engage with different communities and which bridges we're choosing to build is really important to think about. Um, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, is talk to the participants and ask them, um, you know, and, and not making assumptions and seeing who people are comfortable working with. Um, so yeah, that, that's where I would start. You know, and, and unfortunately, the way the, the study is structured now, obviously, if somebody asks for a particular type of therapist, we can't necessarily guarantee that. But I think that's where we would start in having that conversation. Um, and then to that and to the question that was asked over here earlier, um, I have this fantasy vision day when these medicines are are legally available and, and we're, we're able to work with them on a larger scale and we can have treatment centers that that are run by you know queer people of color for queer people of color um, for trans people by trans people and we have enough people trained um, and hopefully in those numbers that, that Amy showed earlier today as we're training we can get more you know representation and get more people in there um, so that we have this incredible force of people ready to go out and, and, and you know, provide to their own communities. So. Are any of you working with youth, like queer youth at all? Not with psychedelics. <laughs> um. When people talk about the psychedelic experience, uh, particularly the plant medicines, um, you often hear the words masculine and feminine um, when kind of t people talking about the sort of energetic qualities of certain plants. You know, ayahuasca is a more feminine energy and peyote or tobacco is more masculine. Um, do you think that those using those terms um, can be valuable in sort of thinking and talking about the the experience, or does it just kind of perpetuate the um, gender binary? Any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think that I personally think they can be useful terms. I think masculinity and femininity are real energies. I think just acknowledging that they both exist in all of us and we all have different um, different ways of expressing those. I think it's not necessarily enforcing the binary to, to use the terms, but to, to recognize that we're not all one or the other. And perhaps the medicines aren't either. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for um, bringing in uh, queer theory into the dialogue. I find it really rich. Um, my question was inspired by Jay. You said uh, you're you're interested in um, you know undoing or working with the uh, cultural default network. And I, I thought that was a really striking line. Um, 
And I wondered for, for all of you all, how, how you imagine um, bringing in that kind of sensibility, particularly around gender and sexuality and um, what kind of framework, context, setting might you imagine for uh, using psychedelics in that way to help facilitate kind of undoing those internalized social structures that keep gender and sexuality really bound up? Um, well, um, I think first of all, the medicines themselves um, have a lot to say about that. Like we talk about the default network because um, because there's you know some MRI studies that that's the that that central network gets kind of shut down for a while under the influence of LSD or psilocybin, and um, so I think it points the way towards that there are all these other parts of our maybe brains, our consciousness, or experience that have potential important healing information for us that um, that we get just because we have to navigate our way through our lives and through the planet, we get very linear and narrow. And um, I, I think my experience personally, and also what I understand about the academic studies, is um, is that there's a loosening, there's a um, there's an increased sense of possibility, and then we get to decide. I think that's part of what's happening here that's so rich this weekend is that we get to then take all this information download and figure out with our unconscious selves and our conscious selves and our limited selves and our expansive selves how we're going to make use of the downloads um, moving forward. I was just going to say that I think being a sexual minority in our culture is traumatic for everybody and that the use of like MDMA or ayahuasca for things that treat PTSD can treat that trauma because that's part of super profound inner... When you see people that have had sexual abuse, you see it affects all of their whole life while having your sexuality be a problem and be a secret or be made fun of or whatever is very traumatic and in that way I think that the trauma undoing nature of a lot of these psychedelics can be useful. And as uh, many of you said that LSD was used as conversion therapy so the nature of the drug doesn't necessarily affirm identity it's up to us to create spaces cultural spaces of acceptance and that's how the medicine ends up doing its work. Without the culture, we don't have it. Last question? Yeah. Uh, I'll just be left. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, quite a few of you have talked about how everything that we're dealing with right now is couched in colonialism, because that is what we have to deal with in this globalized setting now. Um, I was just wondering if any of you have any thoughts on how we can start to decolonize the self so that, or the movement that we are in. How would you suggest that people start approaching decolonization so that we can actually get to this bottom-up approach instead of this top-down approach that has not been working as far as acceptance on a wide scale, socially, culturally, of um, not only psychedelics use, but also queerness. And uh, how do we de decolonize to mitigate the damage caused by the idea of otherness? I think um, educating ourselves as to the ways that we've been colonized is the first thing, because <clears throat> I think a lot of people don't understand why our culture is the way it is. And so, that's the first thing I would say. Um, I think for me what that brings up is the, um, the realization that um, white folks have racial trauma to heal too. <laughs> that we, we have to heal from the trauma of what um, our ancestors are responsible for, whether that's through our direct lineage or 
um, you know, by the nature that we're a, a white person and a colonized on a colonized land, um, and um, you know, really being able to like somehow own that and integrate that and not be afraid of that to in order to free ourselves. It's like in order to heal something, you truly have to feel it, and the, like the grief we have about what. Um, you know, what as white people where, um, you know, we have either wittingly or unwittingly inherited. So I, th I think, you know, really engaging in that healing process as white people is really important. Um, I guess to that, I would just add that that's, I hope that's what we're doing here today. And that's what we're doing as part of this larger conversation and why we're, we're all in this room or one of the reasons we're in this room. So this is a start. Um, and to add to what Clancy said, yeah, unfortunately, you know, a large part of our country, I suppose, doesn't even see it as a problem. So we have a lot of education to do around that. And you know, that's a whole conversation. How do, how do we make that change, you know, at the, the societal level, the education level, like across all of the, the different facets of our society, but yeah. Oh yeah, um, I'm writing a book called The Wild Kindness and there's a, a kind of an excerpt on Lenny Letter right now and um, you're quite, it's basically about decolonization and this is really not natural for Westerners to give power to a plant or let alone an unruly fungus, and that that act is <laughs> in itself a, a decolonization. And, and so for me, it's been a process of, of paying attention to how we need babysitters and gatekeepers and esoteric shamans because it's like it, the incomprehensible is uncomfortable, but in doing, in doing that, we recreate structures of hierarchy so so the I'm, I'm an outlier i live in the desert um i've grown mushrooms in the past up until i got a little bit too public to do so and um and and it i just i hope the book shows um you know an outside the box way of being having a psychedelic life where um you um where you don't need to have a guru and all that. The plant, yeah. I mean, like, I, like so many people have come up to me after Michael Pollan's book, wanting me to get a nurse for them. They're like, Do you, "We're going to get a therapist or a nurse um, for a psilocybin experience," and I'm like, "The nurse is called the mushroom and find a hippie and go outside in the daytime or the nighttime, so we're safe." And and it, it's like the simplicity sometimes of these things. It's hilarious how it takes so much for us to get there. So. He has been great support in helping me um, just do this book. Thanks, Bia. Yeah, just want to plug in a gig for our next thing that's going to happen in here in CIS, 19, November 19. It's a woman in psychedelics. I think that's also part of the decolonization conversation. And we're going to continue that. Um, and so you're all pre invited. And I just want to thank you and say that this panel, you know, leaves us with very nice perfume and. You know, the level of kindness and elegance that was displayed here talking about all these heart issues is very welcoming because this symposium has been a journey and <laughs> has been intense. So I, I think, you know, that's one lesson from the queer mov movement is like there's beauty, there's, you know, sensuality. I really much appreciate what, what you contributed here. Break time, we have four, four o'clock, we meet again here. Thank you all.